Thank, thank you, Ian, so much for that, that masterclass. Um, so moving on, uh, Ian mentioned terminology. So our next speaker, uh, Dr. Di Evans, uh, will be telling us a bit more about terminology. What is this NOMAD, ICD, OCPS, DMND, LOINC is? What, what does it all mean? I was talking to Dai this morning, who I only met for the first time today, quite incredibly. And he told me he's been a GP for nearly 30 years, and he's never used paper to practice medicine. That's actually quite incredible. Um, so anyhow, on that note, uh, Dai. Um, I'm actually going to rephrase that slightly. Right. Since coming into, um, I started out in, of course, like us all in, in, in hospitals, uh, where we use paper, uh, great big wadges of it, folders of it. Um, but it was moving into primary care. And right from the get-go, when I started in the 80s, I was straight onto electronic records. And it was interesting because I had to take a step back today in the realization that there are people in this room who are clinicians who are using paper. Um, I, like the rest of you, learnt to write with one of these things, um, with a pen and paper, but I had to learn how to enter uh, a medical record using first one finger uh, and then gradually six. Um, so, uh, what we're about today, um, I hope, if I'm pressing the next button, and again, Try again. Great. What we're, what we're actually fundamentally here about is not IT, it's about provision of care. Okay, it's about provision of patient care. Now, I liken the provision of patient care to a chair. Um, it has um, the chair, an NHS provision, um, has four legs. And to me, one of these legs is the patient, a second leg in patient care is primary care, a third leg Secondary care, fourth leg, community care. Well balanced, it's great. But if any one of those legs gets slightly knocked out of kilter, the patient becomes more frail, a bit demented. Then the strain starts to appear on the other legs. If a local authority starts to amend how community care is funded and delivered, the strain goes somewhere else. In the core of that, on this rickety chair, is information, is the patient records. And that's what we're going to be basing our care upon. So there's the patient care. We're dependent as health professionals of whatever kind on information. That in turn is dependent on patient records, which in turn have content which is presented by the architecture and, uh, and, and the mechanisms that Ian was talking about. That content um, I was reviewing this during the week and thinking, actually, the content's even changing as I'm standing here. Um, the content uh, may be documents, maybe photographs of skin lesions, maybe ECGs, maybe hospital letters, but actually, fundamentally, at its core, for the last uh, yeah, nearly 30 years, um, I'm coming to end of my career, the content for me has been a mixture, a well-balanced mixture of free texts and codes and codes. You know, whether it's T5501, spacecraft accident, no ground crew injured, um, or H33 asthma. Uh, boy, am I going to have a hard job with SNOMED. Um, fundamentally, uh, we are here, though, about care provision. Um, care provision in the NHS is patchwork care delivered by groups of us with different skill sets, whether we're a healthcare support worker or a tertiary center transplant surgeon. There is a varied case mix. Um, we're often part-time health professionals, increasingly so. Um, and, and the patients in there too, working with us and alongside us, we're working alongside them. So the delivery of good quality care depends on well-maintained records and good communication. And uh, I, I didn't know we were going to have this chat talking this morning, um, Robert Vactor, Bob Vactor. But within the report, if you read it, and, and you really should, whether you're primary or secondary care, um, there's a conclusion there. We cannot emphasize enough that the purpose is to radically improve the chances that important information will be available when and where it's needed, wherever that is, in the pharmacy, in the ICU, in general practice, 
because no health system or clinician can perform at the top of their potential if that information is not available. No health system or clinician can perform at the top of their potential if that information is not available. Now, there were comments made earlier um, uh, about uh, using IT systems and how they slow people down. And when I started using it, a 10-minute consultation took 11 minutes starting to get to grips with the system. Within a year, those, those 11 minutes had shrunk to eight because I was getting useful information out of the electronic record that I could never get out of the paper. It meant that I was starting to be able to do stuff I could never do before. And a decade downstream, it meant that we were taking care out of secondary care into primary care and doing stuff which we couldn't do before. So where we are now in the health service and what we're delivering in primary care, would, I don't think would have been possible with paper records. Another point that was made was that data, information, must come in a usable, actionable form. <coughs> Comments at the bottom there about training, we think about later. So the patient record, however you handle it in terms of a blank sheet of paper or big bundle of files or an EPR. Um, the patient record, for me, acts at the very least as an aid memoir. So in the 45 uh, seconds it takes the patient from me buzzing uh, the, the, the buzzer or calling them in, I can actually look at the patient's uh, diagnosis summaries, I can look at the last consultation, I can look at their medication, I can look at their, uh, their latest blood test and maybe even the last hospital record. And in the 45 seconds it takes the patient um, to skip gaily into my consulting room, I've actually got their entire medical history loaded up here. In fact, including the fact that they've just been to Spain on holiday. Um, so it's an aid memoir to me. It means I, I, it looks like I think I know what I'm talking about. Hey. Um, but it is also a, a form of communication over time um, and between individuals of the salient relevant information needed to deliver care. So coming back a step, the record content is composed broadly of a mixture of the architectural structures that, that present the content and its embedded content which may be free text or encoded data. For those of you who are thinking about how to use EPRs for the first time, that balance of free text versus encoded data is, is quite interesting. And, and I think to produce a, a proper, well-balanced EPR, you have to use both. Certainly, if you're working in psychiatry, psychology, there's going to be a lot more free text. Because any terminology cannot capture the full breadth and depth of human experience or clinical uh, concepts. There has to be room in there for free text. So what is a clinical terminology? It's a coded classification of clinical concepts. By clinical concepts, I mean blood pressure value, heart attack, uh, ORF. And it is there and designed to enable recording of accurate clinical information in an EPR so that the information can be easily retrieved. And you want to retrieve it either so it's human readable or computer readable, so it can be used in decision support or whatever. Now, there's a lot of uh, information that uh, I would like to have put in here, but it is not. Um, it's in the supplementary slides that will appear or not appear while you're off at lunch. So for those of you who want to download or, or look at the presentations, a lot of other stuff lurking in there. The desiderata, what you need to put into a clinical terminology is a paper by James Camino in, in, in the late 90s. That's contained within there. The other thing I want to just focus on so that people are aware of this is that clinical terminologies are predominantly updated frequently. Now, we update, uh, SNOMED is updated twice a year, uh, the read codes, updated twice a year while they're hanging around. Um, but drug data dictionaries are updated much more frequently in terms of uh, monthly or more so. So bear in mind that what you, if you're designing one of these systems with inbuilt terminology, you are going to have to review it every six months at least. So I've talked about concepts. Now these concepts, such as a heart attack, are represented by codes. So a read version 2 code for heart attack, G30. Um, if you're in clinical terms, version 3. 
uh, X200E. They're codes, that is all. Um, they come with terms that sit alongside them, phrases that we can read, acute myocardial infarction. They may have synonyms, heart attack um, or coronary thrombosis. So we have a concept, which is the heart attack, represented by a code within the system associated with terms. And there's a blizzard of coding systems out there. We have the clinical terminologies, read version two, clinical terms version three, and SNOMED CT, currently in use in the NHS. There are the classifications, ICD-10, for instance, OPCS4. Um, if you're working in a laboratory environment, you might be using LOINC. You might be using your own bespoke system of codes. Uh, if you're using medication, again, you might be using your own particular drug data dictionary, or you might be using the UK standard DM&D, Dictionary of Medicines and Devices. Um, or you may be using a radiology set. I, I'm looking at genetics data and how that's going to be represented. I'm really interested in how we're going to represent the phenomenal richness of genetics data uh, as it starts to flow across uh, into the current terminologies. Blimey. So what kind of concepts, what kind of information are we encoding? Well, I'm going to take an example from uh, read version two, which is what m just about the majority of uh, UK primary care systems are using today. Um, we have different kinds of information held there. Occupations in chapter zero, uh, examination signs, 246, blood pressure, uh, laboratory uh, procedures, 42, uh, might be some form of glycosylated hemoglobin. Uh, your total hip replacement will be in chapter seven. Uh, and administrative codes down in chapter nine. So there's different types of concepts. On top of that, we have diagnostic chapters from infectious diseases through congenital conditions in chapter P. Um, and read version two also handles internally medication in terms of chapters representing the broad groups uh, of drugs we use uh, in chapters represented with its initial code being a, a lowercase um, letter. So concepts can, you, you can capture a huge number of concepts in there. Um, traditionally, okay, we have a terminology, read version two for the sake of argument here, contains codes, A1, A13, A130, associated with terms. Uh, and those terms, um, tuberculous meningitis, you can see that there is a kind of hierarchy. There's a relationship here uh, between these terms. So that tuberc A130 is a child of A13 in terms of child of A1. Um, so there is a relationship between the codes and between the concepts they're trying to represent. That's great for uh, actually searching. If you want all kinds of TB, you look for all the codes starting in A1. However, this leads to a constraint on the system. The, the, these codes are now meaningful in some way. There is meaning embedded in that code. For those of you in the audience who are clinicians, you will of course know that, that tuberculous meningitis is not only an infectious disease, it is also a neurological disorder. And this is one of the problems of a single axial hierarchy. Uh, that should actually occur in two places. Uh, so in fact, the code has had to be replicated and stuffed into another chapter to enable that really to happen. So here it is, meningitis tuberculosis, or tuberculous meningitis. So therein is an inherent problem in the single axial um, hierarchies. So moving on, um, you could get multi-axial hierarchies, which gets around that problem. Here, tuberculous meningitis is now a child, it's modern, it's got more than, you know, more than simple parents. It's a child of TB, and it's a child of bacterial meningitis, and in turn, that is a child of neurological disorder. Um, you can see that the, the codes that are associated um, are now no longer, they, they, they don't follow in a, in a kind of hierarchical sequence, so the F004 is a child both of A13 and ultimately a descendant of X000E. The codes here are meaningless. That means that we're no longer constrained to um, five, uh, five characters, 
um, and, and, and five levels of hierarchy, we can have I infinite levels of hierarchy if we need. It means we can capture more information. Um, so, at this point, I just want to reflect back very briefly on the UK uh, clinical, um, or, or at least the history of clinical terminologies uh, in the UK, um, and why we are where we are now. Uh, to start with, um, well, not to start with, but th there were people looking at this all over the place. Uh, and the first kind of uh, stream or rivulet really was a, a group of people together, coming together, uh, one of whom early on was James Reed, um, where they decided that uh, they wanted to be able to capture uh, data in, in, in these early computers. Now, one perhaps reason for developing codes is that uh, the memories of the early devices were not particularly big. So representing diabetes mellitus as C2 uh, actually saves on space. As, so they, they kind of looked for what are the commonest things we want to capture and look at. And they came up with, a, you know, we'll have the first 100 codes. Um, and, and his mates came up with 500. Um, and, and a good idea was born. By the time we get to 1984, four-byte read codes existed. Now, a four-byte code means it has four characters, um, and 10,000 codes were sitting in this code-dependent subtype hierarchy. So that G41, acute myocardial infarction, is a child of G4, uh, which is probably some form of ischemic heart disease. Um, they quite quickly realized that um, a four-byte a four uh, system wasn't going to capture all the concepts, so they shifted to five bytes in the late 80s, uh, 30,000 codes initially, moving on towards 100,000 in, in five-byte read. Um, and over half of the UK systems still run on five-byte read, though it, 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 we're in the process of moving onwards to SNOMED, its ultimate successor. Again, they realized that 90,000 co concepts wasn't going to be enough, and during the 90s, CTV3, clinical terms version 3, was born uh, without the single axial um, hierarchical structure. Um, and so this was multi-axial. Um, X200E became myocardial infarction. And then as we moved through the millennium, um, it, it, we moved towards the marriage of CTV3 and uh, the American College of Pathologists, uh, SNOMED, into SNOMED CT, which is now uh, the NHS standard, and to which we're all moving by 2020-odd um, um, in, in all our systems. So the underlying terminology of the future for us in the NHS will be um, SNOMED CT um, and, and various associated elements. Uh, just to take a pause for a second on what are terminologies and classifications. Um, a terminology aims to represent increasingly num increasing numbers of useful concepts but you, but you can't actually capture all concepts. Classifications, on the other hand, aim to categorize all their domain concepts. So um, if, you, if you're involved in statistics, you'll want to say, OK, I want to look at myocardial infarctions. We've got uh, anterior infarctions, posterior infarctions, lateral infarctions, and the rest. And, and a classification will have a bin which handles the rest sometimes not otherwise specified as its title, or NOS. Um, and, and any kind of, M, uh, of, of heart attack can be put in one of those bins. The only problem with that bin at the end is that subsequently you might want to um, recategorize some of the stuff that's in the bin into formally described concepts. Uh, and that, of course, can play havoc with your statistics. Um, ICD is the commonest. Um, or, or probably the most widely known in this room, the International Classification of Diseases. It's be, it actually has its origins back with Florence Nightingale in the 1860s. Um, I've got an edition, I've got the fourth edition, which is 1906 odd um, at home. Um, so it's pretty old, it's been around a long time, managed by WHO, used in 117 countries for all kinds of stuff, mortality data, uh, billing, research, health conditions about 14 and a half thousand codes. Some countries have expanded the US has put in operation codes, plugged it in as well, so they've got closer to 60,000. Um, currently, we use it in the UK for recording secondary care data. Um, ICD-10 does have a direct map into SNOMED, so that's inherent there. Um, 
Another uh, classification used here of the Office of Population and Census Statistics, number four, type, or version four, the OPCS classification of surgical ops, uh, UK only, I think, um, used to classify surgical procedures. They're not within ICD uh, in the UK. It's been around since 1987, uh, and it's an NHS standard currently, which will probably ultimately be replaced by SNOMED. So, um, there's a couple of examples of, of classifications, and, and I just want to, to look at the moment. Uh, Jeremy's going to cover SNOMED in, in, in greater depth tomorrow. But SNOMED CT, which is, um, it, it's international. Um, this isn't just the UK, it's not just America, lots of European countries. Um, that subsumes uh, previous versions of the NHS standards. Read version two is subsumed by clinical terms version three. All those codes are in there, all these codes are in here. It has inherent maps to ICD. Uh, there are handcrafted maps to OPCS4 available um, from uh, NHS Digital's TRUD database, terminological reference update distribution service thingy. Um, Jeremy will probably correct me tomorrow. Um, but the TRUD database is where you can get anything on this uh, around terminologies and classifications. The core of this is international, which means actually we can share the development. It means also we can share subsets uh, and, and reference sets that relate to a particular topic. Hooked onto this in, in the different countries, we, may we will have the different countries' drug formularies. They vary from country to country. They embed in. And we also have our own UK clinical edition, which has terms peculiar to the UK that aren't necessarily needed on an international basis. Um, approved vendors can also have their own uh, bit of um, development space to develop their own codes, so long as they follow editorial guidelines, and these can hook in as well. Just going to highlight that SNOMED has an arrangement with the uh, Regenstrief Institute, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, who manage LOINC, which is a laboratory observations um, classification. Uh, and in theory, they don't overlap, they kind of meet. I have to say that there are, you know, if you're working with these things, there's difficulties around how some of these things actually plug in together. Um, for, for those of us working with the data, it's not always straightforward. Um, so SNOMED CT, we're all moving to it by April 2020. It's international. Um, there are, uh, as I said, inherent maps. Um, and it, it is meant to handle all the requirements of terminologies. Um, it also is fully versioned. Uh, uh, so. Uh, I'm just going to put up here as an example. Um, this is the concept myocardial infarction with its code and description. Uh, it is a child of multiple parents. It also has attributes. Um, ischemic heart disease has a, a morphology attribute of infarct. So this almost is like coming, instead of having just a straightforward multi-axle, straightforward multi-axle hierarchy, you can come at it from the side um, and, and create a kind of three-dimensional cube now of um, terminology. Um, the descriptions also have their own IDs. Uh, at the bottom here, you can have an example of a different language ID, Infactus du Mayocart, which is French-Canadian. Uh, these have their own um, IDs as well. So the, the, but the core concept is universal throughout SNOMED. Um, I'm going to shift on just for the last few minutes um, <coughs> in a second. But why do we use codes? We use codes to speed data input and retrieval. They just make that whole process a damn sight easier than handling free text. There is um, natural language processing out there, but you know, that, that's pretty hard. Um, we use codes to build diagnostic summaries, to link consultations together, facilitate decision support, communication, research management planning, but fundamentally to make care efficient and safer. Um, for those of you who haven't, who are still working on paper, um, here's an example of an EPR where we have a, a problem title stuck into a particular part of the structure, uh, and this enables linkages. Uh, so you put that problem title in, and straight away you get data entry screens coming up. You also get ac instant access to patient information leaflets or to professional resources. You can find out about the condition as you, uh, as you work with a patient. 
and you can get previous consultations. So actually having those codes embedded in the right way starts to make stuff useful you could never do with paper records. Um, we embedded in here is a block of free text because of course you can't represent everything with concepts. You can't represent everything with codes. And if you want to have a, a, a free flowing consultation, you're still gonna need free text. Um, together with all its misspellings and abbreviations. Um, further down, we have a block of predominantly coded terms, uh, which are human readable, uh, associated with values. Um, and these have been entered via a, a data entry template, which is handy if you're engaged in the checklist approach. Um, but it also means those data items can then be used in decision support elsewhere. Uh, just for interoperability purposes, if you hit the test request button, that sends a message off to the local lab and you can request blood tests and also see blood test results that you can then hook back and sync into your system. Warning. Yeah, good. Um, UK primary care has had the best IT systems in the world, without doubt. There are a lot of guys hanging around in bedrooms late at night programming stuff in the, in the 1970s and 80s who then got medical degrees and went on to write these things. There is huge amounts of data in them. But um, there is a question of data quality. There are defining principles about it. Um, complete, accurate, relevant, consistent. And I'm putting this up here because there are people in the room who might not have come across this before. Where can it go wrong? We already have examples where free text has been entered into um, uh, patient records and translated as codes. Uh, which therefore have labelled hundreds, thousands probably, of patients with um, depressive illness. Uh, that happened on several occasions during uh, the, the early noughties. Um, codes uh, sometimes um, that are put into data entry forms maybe may have the wrong code sitting behind them, so you're distributing the wrong data. Remember, everybody in this room ultimately for better or worse, is a patient. And you have ele an electronic patient record. And I can tell you that getting erroneous data off your record is not easy. So everybody entering data has to be trained in how to use the system and how to use the terminology they're using. OK, so think about that for those of you who are engaging in this. You may get the wrong code selection from picking lists, the wrong patient for sure, the wrong leg, the wrong episode type. But I just wanted to show you this in the last minus nine seconds I have. Um, that This is the average for diabetic retinopathy uh, uh, prevalence in the UK. We've got data from 7,200 practices where we've interrogated their data quality. We can see practices have from three to eight times uh, the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy because the code for diabetic retinopathy was stuck behind a data entry form for diabetic retinopathy screening. So when, when the users were thought they were putting diabetic retinopathy screening in, they were encoding that patient's record with the fact that they have the disease of diabetic retinopathy. Um, multiple hy hysterectomies. In this current age of uh, the NHS market, you can buy one, get one free. So um, you know we've got uh, four patients with three or four hysterectomies, one with 12. This is because you don't people not understanding how the record is put together Sure, you can broadly usually only have one hysterectomy, um, but what does this mean about the data quality uh, and, and handling people with multiple pulmonary emboli or multiple infarcts where it does matter? That's where it matters. This is just a, a pointer that there's a problem. Uh, data completeness, good quality practice. This is another practice down the road. This is looking at the content that's sitting there. And I can tell you, if you're working in one of these practices, it's bloody difficult. Your consultation time adds instantly an extra three minutes. Um, possibly up to 25 is my record so far. Uh, and sometimes you get the same codes added on the same day saying completely different things. Does this patient have mild COPD or moderate? Uh, and, and it matters because actually it starts to cause inconsistencies and poor use of the information downstream. Um, an example of record curation, back in the early, uh, late 90s, probably secondary care loved our summaries coming through. Great. Now they're full of cr absolute crap. A very, they're computer readable, but not human readable. Um, and this is the same summary once it's been tidied up. People will have to curate the records and learn to do it if you're going to develop um, um, 
uh, safe care. Um, interoperability, some potential issues, the kind of last slide, data clashes between silos. If you've got information coming from different places that conflict, how are we going to handle that? How are we going to handle the different dates on events? How are we going to say, how are we going to reconcile the fact that this is a total hip replacement? I know what one of those is. I might not know what a Sheehan uh, hip replacement is. Um, how do we pull that together? Um, information provenance, I had, I, I, daily I get these. Yesterday I had a patient sitting down saying, I've never had a, 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 um, a, an intracerebral bleed. He hadn't. Um, he'd picked it out. It was a tentative diagnosis from A&E that had gone along the electronic system and into ours. Um, how much data do you share and so forth? So every person entering clinical data on an EPR needs appropriate training how to use their system and to have an understanding of that system. Um, some resources and lunch. <laughs>